Production of Caesar Guided Tour is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Caesar Guided Tour. The Caesar Guided Tour is a series of videos where I build Caesar, an iTunes inspired music player for Apple platforms feature by feature. In this episode, I'll be making the location of the Caesar library file customizable via the preferences window. This implies implementing the following things modifying Caesar's initialization to use our custom library path, adding a preferences window, letting the user specify a custom library path from within the preferences window, and reinitializing the app to prevent a relaunch when the user changes the library path. With the functionality implemented in this episode, Caesar guided tour videos will have caught up to version 2021.10.20. Please note that while this episode was recorded after the release of Caesar 2021.11.19, all code shown will reflect the state of the code base immediately following the implementation of the features covered in this video. Prior to these changes, Caesar's library path was hard-coded to a location in my personal home directory, which meant that anyone who pulled down the source directory had to manually change that location in the code base for it to work properly. Obviously, it's not really acceptable to ship an app like this, so the idea here is to do two things. We want a default library path that will be universally applicable to any user launching Caesar for the first time. And we want a configurable library path that will be stored in Caesar's preferences file that can override that default path. Our default path for the user's library on first launch is going to be pretty standard for most Mac apps written in the last decade. In case you're not familiar, a user's home directory on macOS has a hidden folder called library, which holds various preference files and data for installed applications. One of the subfolders within library is called application support. This is generally where applications not making use of iCloud store their associated data by default. So here in the migration helper class, I've added a new static method called app support directory path that attempts to look up the user's application support folder and appends a Caesar subfolder to its path, which would be the direction in which we would keep our data. Next, we need to modify the existing default path method, which used to return the hard-coded database path I mentioned earlier, to take that app support directory, attempt to create the Caesar subfolder if it doesn't already exist, and then appends the default library name, which is caesarlibrary.salib, and return that path as the default path for our user's music library. So that does it for the default path, but what happens if the user chooses a different path, and where is that path going to be stored? For this, we'll be using user defaults. Every app has a bundle identifier that has a sort of reverse URL structure. For example, Caesar's identifier is netr chcesura because the developer's URL is r chnet and the project name belonging to that developer is Caesura. If you set or load preferences through user defaults, it will seamlessly use a preferences file named after your bundle identifier located in the user's library under the preferences subfolder. You can just use a user defaults object as if it was a plain old dictionary data structure and it will transparently persist things to that preferences file. It's pretty great. So here within the new current path method on migration helper, we first ask user defaults if we have a string for the key library path in our preferences file and store it in the library path variable. If library path has a value, meaning that the user has set a custom path, but that file can't be found anymore, we need to make a choice about what to do in this case. One way to go about it would be to simply create a new blank library in that spot. Another would be to simply revert to the default library location, and that's the one I ended up going with. The main reason I chose this is to safeguard against people who put their libraries on an external drive and then launch the app when the drive isn't mounted. It could cause some major issues if I just try to plow through even though the drive isn't mounted, so this seemed like the safer approach. It might not be the best approach, but for now, let's just roll with it. If library path is nil, that means your user didn't set a custom path, and thus we should set library path to the return value of the default path method. Then we can simply return the library path variable from current path. First things first, to prepare things for later in the video when we'll need to reinitialize the app once the library path has been modified, I took the body of application did finish launching and moved all of it over to a new method called setup scissor instance. Within that method, we declare a library path constant, which loads the value of migration helper.current path instead of migration helper.default path, like we did in previous versions. If that value is nil, we would need to crash with something like a fatal error call, as we can't find a writable library destination. Then we just do what we used to do run migrations and set up the library service, but now we do it with this library path variable instead. If the open main window argument to this method is true, we also instantiate the main window again manually. This will be needed later when we'll soft reset the application if the library path has been modified from within the preferences window. 
Our application did finish launching method then gets much shorter, simply replacing its body with a call to the setup scissor instance method, not requiring a manual instantiation of the main window because the storyboard already does it for us. We also added an instance variable called did finish launching, which will be used by our main windows view controllers to change their behavior depending on how they were initialized. We set that to true once application did finish launching is completed. Obviously, we don't want managing your library's location to be located in the main window. That would be crazy, so we're going to need a preferences window in Caesura. The preferences window right now doesn't manage anything other than the library location, so it's incredibly bare bones in design. I'm sure I'll eventually find more things to jam in here, but for now, this'll do. We've got a text field here, which will contain the path to the library file currently in use. We've got a label on top of that to explain what the text field is for. And then we've got three action buttons. Move current library, which lets you move the currently loaded library to a different path on disk. Load different library, which lets you load a library that has been moved previously. And reset to defaults, which lets you revert to the default library location. Next up, we've got a look at the IB action that handles the preferences menu item getting selected. While storyboards recommend the use of segues to automatically instantiate and navigate between screens of your application, in practice, these can be quite limiting and buggy, so I'm opting to instantiate my windows manually, all while continuing to define those windows and their contents in the storyboard file. So this here is pretty standard storyboard instantiation code. First, we access the main storyboard by grabbing a reference to nsstoryboard.main. Then we declare a scene identifier of the name prefs-window-controller, which we defined in interface builder. From our main storyboard, we ask it to instantiate the controller with that ID. And then we receive an instance of our window controller on which we can call show window to make the window appear. One obvious issue with this code that's still an issue in the current shipping version of Caesura is that this code doesn't limit you in how many preferences windows you can have open at a time. In the future, I'd like to limit the user to having one preferences window open at a time. But it's not a huge deal for now because users aren't realistically going to sit there and open 6,000 preferences windows. Once the preferences window opens, we're going to want to populate the text field that holds our application's current library path with the current library path. We have an IV outlet declared on Preferences View Controller called Library Path Field, which contains a reference to our Windows Library Path text field. Then in our view will appear method, we can set its string value to the return value of migration helper.currentPath. Now let's hook up our action buttons. One of the actions in our preferences window requires the use of the open dialog box. In order for the desired file type to be properly supported, we need to declare a uniform type identifier for a library's files. As I mentioned during the drag and drop implementation on episode 3, UTIs are basically string based identifiers that represent a file or content type. Unlike the drag and drop implementation, though, where we created UTIs that were entirely internal to our application, we're going to create a UTI that's exported to the main operating system, which means it'll be recognized in the get info dialog or in the kind column of finder list views when Caesarean is installed. To declare an exported type identifier, you need to go to your target settings under the Info tab and under the Exported Type Identifier section. Here we've declared a Caesura library UTI with the identifier net.r-ch.caesura.library. We list that it conforms to public.data, public.content, and public.database, which are broader categories of UTIs that other applications can recognize, and specify that its file extension is .salib. All right, let's start off by implementing the button that lets us move the existing library by taking a look at the move library button press method on preferences view controller. We're going to bring up an NS save panel, which is the system standard save dialog box. We're going to define the content type of our save document as being the ones that match the file name extension of Salib and set that to the save panels allowed content types property. Then we can present it to the user using the run modal method. If the user names their file and clicks the save button, we take the target file URL that we receive from that save panel and convert it into a file path. Then we attempt to move the file from the old path to the new path via the file manager class. If that succeeds, we change the value of the library path text field to the new path and save that path as the library path preference in the application's user defaults. We also set the should reload library property on the view controller to true so that we'll try to soft reset the app when closing the window. Loading a different library is similar, but makes use of an open dialog box instead. Here in the load different library button pressed method, we declare an NS open panel, which can open a single file only. 
Then we declare its allowed file type to be the net.r-ch.scissor.library UTI we exported in our project's info.plist. This was actually how I tested that I had exported it properly when I was originally writing this feature. If you mess it up, it simply won't let you pick the file that you think you should be able to pick. We then present it with the run modal method, and if a file is picked, we convert its file URL to a path, change the contents of the library path text field, save it to the library path preference, and set the should reload library property on the view controller to true. Resetting to defaults is even simpler as it involves no dialog boxes of any kind. Pressing this button calls the reset to defaults button pressed method, which in turn deletes the library path preference in our app's user defaults, resets the library path text field's value to the default path according to the migration helper class, and sets the should reload library property on the view controller to true. I suppose one glaring omission from this feature set in the preferences window is the inability to explicitly create a second library. One workaround is that you can move a library to a different location and then revert to defaults to create a second one at the default location, which can then be moved to a different location, resulting in two libraries that are not in the default location. The preferences window could also benefit from having something like a dropdown for recent libraries that were used, but maybe I'm a weird edge case because I swap between a lot of libraries when testing. Ideally, what you would want is that when you close the preferences window, the app would soft reset and reinitialize itself, loading instead the specified database file. This is easier said than done, and to be honest, even this implementation as it exists today is flawed and buggy. We're going to return to the app delegate and take a look at teardown scissor instance, which is a method that will be called to shut everything down before booting the application back up again. This method first pauses playback and then resets the collection queue player on the app delegate to nil. Then we send out a notification center notification called the teardown notification. The Caesura window controller, which manages the main window, subscribes to these notification and calls its own close method when it gets one to close the main window automatically when a teardown is requested. In our preferences view controller class, we need to override the view will disappear method to actually cause the soft reset to occur when the window is closed if the library path was changed. Our implementation for this method first checks if the library path was changed by checking the should reload library instance variable. If it's true, we first call teardown scissor instance on the app delegate class. Then once that's taken care of, we call setup scissor instance while specifying that the main window should be manually reopened. Now, if you stop here and go try this out, you'll realize that after the soft reset, the window opens up again, but it's completely empty. Now, in some contexts, that's fine since you might be opening up an empty library, but I mean, universally, you won't have any sources listed in the source list and no tracks in the collection view. So what gives? If you recall from episodes two and three, at app launch, our window gets shown by the storyboard before the application has technically finished launching and before the database stack has been initialized. To counteract this, we needed to subscribe to the application did finish launching notification and refresh our view controllers in response to that notification so the content could be displayed at app launch. Now that's fine and dandy, but it also means that if we're reopening the window later in our app's lifecycle, we're never going to receive that notification because the app already finished launching, and we're never going to reload the source list and collection view so that content shows up. This is why I added the did finish launching property on our app delegate class. We can now look it up in the view did appear methods of these view controllers, and if it's true, we can force a refresh whenever these views appear a second time in the app delegate. Now it turns out that this isn't the only inconsistency with how these windows are instantiated. This leads to a bunch of other bugs that I hadn't noticed at the time, and these bugs remain in the current version of Caesura. For example, initiating playback just fails on the main window after the library has been changed. You need to relaunch the app completely for it to work correctly, which kind of defeats the purpose of doing this whole soft reset thing in the first place. Keep this in the back of your mind. We're starting to pay the price for my clunky app architecture decisions, and it's going to require some re-architecting to make it work correctly and consistently in all scenarios, but we're not gonna get around to fixing it until these videos have fully caught up to where Scissor is today. Before we go, let's take a look at a demonstration of the flexible library location functionality.
And that's it for this week's episode. It took a while, but these videos are finally caught up to the first two versions of Cesaro, which were released throughout the month of October. I'm hoping for these videos to be fully caught up by the end of the year, and then videos can be released in a more timely manner following the implementation and release of new features and fixes. On the next episode, we'll be looking at functionality and fixes bundled into the first November release of Cesura, 2021.11.1. See you then.